Okay. Next speaker is uh, John Brunston. He's going to talk to us about incubating innovation in an academic medical center. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Coming. Um, it's hard hearing in the back, and the, this is the only mic we have, so just we keep that. Is there a way? Yeah, I get that. Yep, yep. Great. Super. Okay. Awesome. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I'm sure it's been a bit of a long day, uh, but uh, I'm excited to tell you a little bit about the innovation program at Boston Children's and what we've been doing to try to get us further down this uh, digital transformation that a lot of health systems are trying to go through. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a detour from the usual ITB2 talk, so hopefully just a little bit of a breather. Um, but, you know, really talk about how we're trying to unlock the value of the data that we're uh, capturing, but also improve the experience on behalf of patients and uh, providers. Um, so I'll just start with a graph. Um, this is actually not from Boston Children's, um, but it's from Partners Healthcare. And it was actually years ago, we went down this path of trying to look at uh, underlying data within our electronic medical record. And it's actually work that um, Sean Murphy was involved in and, and, and tapping in to the early stages of, of thinking about what it means to tap into electronic medical record. This is sort of pre-I2B2. Uh, we noticed a massive increase in heart attacks that were on the rise in the early 2000s and subsequently went away. Um, and that was potentially at least, you know, it's hard to prove causality linked to the introduction and then removal of Vioxx um, that took place over that period of time. Um, the, more, the important message from, what, from this graph was that, you know, there was a significant increase in heart attacks that was happening across the partner system, and essentially nobody knew that it was um, taking place. And it really sort of reveals this issue that we're not leveraging the existing data that we have to make an optimized decisions on part of the patients. Um, but then you sort of look at other industries, and that's sort of kind of obvious that we do this in every other form of our daily lives, where it's our consumption of news or what we buy online, um, and really that doesn't exist on the healthcare front. And so we've sort of been down this path for a number of years trying to think about how to create that level of personalization that has sort of it sort of forced disruption in other industries. So if you see, you probably don't even recognize these logos anymore, and of course been disrupted by a whole new set of logos. And what we can learn from that level of disruption is the ability to take the data that's been generated by the consumer, and whether that's you know patient or not, and optimize decisions and, and, and create a better experience. And so um, we all know in this fact, this group understands this more than anybody out there that this idea that of why it hasn't happened in healthcare is because of the, la the lack of integration, the siloed aspects of the data sets that we try to tap into to create a complete picture of an individual. And we can't do that to date, or at least most organizations can't, probably many of you are at, at the forefront. Um, I, you know, I take an example from Paul Avilak um, because he's been pushing this concept for a number of years. In fact, my background's in geographic information systems, so I love the analogy that he always uses, which is this idea that how do you start thinking about uh, the patient data sets like sort of the layers in a map and how you integrate those where it's a latitude longitude when you think about GIS it's the, the patient unique identifier to try to bring those data sets together and we've been working for many years through DBMI and other places to try to create those data sets to create that complete picture. My background is really in this concept of digital phenotyping, so data that exists outside of these traditional sort of data collection tools. I won't really talk about that today, um, but there's huge amounts of opportunity as you start to bring that information together. Uh, about five years ago, I took over uh, innovation out of Boston Children's with the idea to try to do a better job of unlocking the data that we have within the organization and try to push us down a path of bringing tech to sort of optimize experiences both for the providers and for the patients where this idea of sort of digital transformation has a lot of important consequences. Uh, digitizing our information, unlocking the value can accelerate innovations and understanding findings and, and allow support in a variety of different ways, extends our reach, and I'll explain that in a moment. Of course, the, the, the view is the more that we can begin to digitize our content um, and optimize clinical decision making with technology, we can, we can lower costs. So what's unique about Boston Children's is that uh, the hospital has put in significant resources to work to, to try to get us down this path of digital transformation. So recognizing what we're good at and what we're not good at, 
um, we have incredible data because you know we're an organization that cares for rare and complex diseases, so we have very unique data assets. Um, we have incredible clinical expertise in those very specific narrow areas of of, of, of of those specific areas of pediatrics, and in fact, you know, some leading health IT, and of course, many of the concepts that we talk about today um, and through you know these next few days actually originated at Boston Children's. A lot of the work around smart and fire and all these concepts of health IT. Um, but in the operationalizing standpoint, we're not very good. And as much as Harvard loves to say that we can do everything, it really is not necessarily the case, um, especially when you want to take things to scale and begin to have mad, uh, massive adoption. And so we started to look at partners across the range uh, and spectrum of areas that are sort of leaders in the particular areas that we're trying to expand in and build products, new ventures, platforms. And as much as we're trying to support uh, research through innovation, the goal is to sort of create um, a, a, a structure that allows sort of research to get, um, you know, the products of research to get to market and, and to help scale. Um, and so the way that we've done this is a few different ways. We've created a whole digital strategy for the, the institution. I'll talk a little bit about some of those areas. Uh, but we've built an accelerator, and at that time it was pretty unique for a health system to have an accelerator where we accept ideas from within the organization and some of the, the best possible ideas get actually commercialized and we've, we've, we've started a number of companies as well as working with outside startups and companies and, and then have a sort of more forward looking sort of view of transformative uh, tech. Um, what also is unique for an innovation program is that it's a pretty large group that's devoted towards that transformation. So full stack uh, engineers um, and digital health experts that can sort of surround an idea and take it from conception all the way to market. And that um, has been incredibly helpful because I don't know how many people interact with innovation programs and other health systems, but they often can be uh, just pure evangelists or figureheads that don't actually have the ability to do anything. Um, and that can be really challenging when you're sort of out there speaking about it, but you actually haven't, don't have an ability to build anything out. On top of that, um, the other thing that Harvard does poorly is look to the outside world for advice on what to do. Um, and as opposed, you know, it's fun to, uh, to, to you know, take your ideas and build it, but you want to look to the outside world, venture capitalist people that have built companies in a variety of different areas and make sure that you're getting the right advice on the things to build versus uh, buy. Um, so we built this accelerator, and now it's about it's been about uh, four years since we we put it in. Um, and essentially, the idea is like grasping with trying to find the best possible ideas from within the organization. There's a lot of incredible research, but things that actually ultimately make sense to build out and and take to market. So beyond just pure piloting at Boston Children's, there's very few things. So create a very big funnel for ideas and try to guide people to the right outcome. But for the best possible ideas, we're actually um, putting resources in and building out those technologies. And I'll, I'll give you a bunch of examples throughout. Um, and we do this sort of idea, which is like, as opposed to a pure sort of um, application process where people get a formulaic letter back saying you're not accepted, we try to do heavily amount of customization. We work with innovators to sort of sprint on other ideas, um, come up with a plan, and if it's not in the accelerator, come up with another plan, which might be research, foundation, smart, you know, other types of, of avenues for, for innovations. So just to give you a sense of the, the sort of the magnitude that it takes to sort of cultivate a few good ideas from an organization, we're you know vetting thousands of ideas um, that are coming through our portfolio, um, and you know we've like for instance over the last few years did due diligence on like almost um, 500 of those, sprinted on on a quarter of those, and by the time you sort of get to the other end, we have a couple dozen companies that we've now formed out of the hospital, either internal ideas that came from researchers or outside companies. Companies that sort of have, you know, sort of best-in-class technology that that we want to work with, and we've had you know a few uh, successful exits of those companies as well. Um, and also to just sort of give you a sense of, of the portfolio, the most amount of work is taking place in sort of the research product area where there's an opportunity to sort of scale and, and, and prove out sort of a technology that was built within the hospital, get it to other it organizations. Um, a few of them are still sort of on the R&D front, um, but the most are sort of in that sort of chasm between sort of, you know, a validated research project in one institution and not quite a commercial uh, uh, endeavor. When you sort of look at that across different focus areas, um, you know, there's a bunch of buckets. And so if you guys are in health systems, you sort of see some of these common themes, trying to improve access to care for patients, you know, screening, uh, 
hair coordination and compliance and data integration, which of course is probably a lot of what you think about here, clinical and efficiency, decision support, digital therapeutics. So all the kind of buzzwords, um, but trying to find sort of the best in class companies in each of those buckets, uh, whether internal or external and, and get those uh, to market. More importantly, we're also, it's not just about startups, it's about working with larger companies. And I'll give you some examples of how we're doing that as well. Um, you know, the idea is, of course, we want to partner with other health systems, other uh, uh, providers, uh, payers, but also, you know, large digital companies that are out there that can provide us support in a variety of different ways. Okay, so what do we actually mean by trying to take some of this technology to improve uh, care delivery? Uh, there's some big themes. Um, some of those you guys have may be directly involved in. The idea you know, of using telemedicine, digital triaging, decision support to improve care, trying to take the, the amount of know-how that exists within an organization, whether it's data or clinical expertise, and embed that into software to improve decision support. So increase access to care, augment our clinical experts, and leveraging real-world data. So those are sort of some of the core themes that our innovation has sort of gone down um, and, and looking to, to bring tech to support. Okay. One of those big areas, I think, um, and I, again, I'm probably sure that almost everybody's experiencing this, which is uh, sort of burnout on the part of our clinical teams, um, the, the burden of documentation and using the EMR, which still sort of weighs down incredibly heavy, although this provider looks super delighted to be uh, engaged in their technology. Uh, they are, um, you know, in, this is one of the biggest issues that we're facing, the idea that sort of technology didn't actually improve anything. In fact, it's just made things more complicated. Um, this is an actual screenshot of one of our uh, colleagues' uh, desks. And honestly, we know that what's happened is the technology that we've added onto our clinical staff means that we're just adding a huge amount more sort of administrative burden. And so that's really sort of eroded sort of the, the, the reason why most people have gone into this practice. And obviously, this is probably preaching the choir and understanding why we're thinking about this. Um, we call it formitis. Um, you know, the idea that so many forms per provider need to be filled out, then our staff, you know, like our clinicians have like you know, over four administrative staff to support their daily activities, not to mention that all the mistakes are occurring from these types of activities. Um, and so a lot of our goal has been to figure out sort of, okay, so if more technology creates more complexity and that complexity endangers uh, patient lives, where are the opportunities to create simplicity, improve patient and provider um, uh, 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 provider practice and experience. So we've gone down this path and you know what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit from super basic things that we've begun to implement to sort of more uh, more advanced. Um, I would assume this crowd probably is much more on the advanced side so maybe uh, all of this will seem like super obvious um, but you know we've had to go down a path and, and as a healthcare provider the basic concept of doing like a Skype visit between a patient and provider is still completely challenging, right? Because we have reimbursement issues, we have still a tech barrier. Uh, so we took over telemedicine a few years ago and started launching virtual visits. So it, that's you know the most basic concept of our digital transformation. And as you can imagine, huge amount of, of potential in this space, the idea that uh, parents of kids don't actually have to travel to do like a post follow-up visit huge amount of satisfaction on on all ends huge cost savings um, and you know we're just now waiting for reimbursement to, to come through for us to really expand the practice of virtual care in a much more significant way but that being the baseline what are all the other things that we can begin to do uh, to improve sort of the flow and, and the practice of, of, of medicine um, so we were involved in a variety of examples. I'll just give you a few different ones just to give you a sense. This one is a company that actually that we helped launch out of Beth Israel, which is called Nutremedy. So the uberfication of healthcare is sort of upon us, um, and that's happening in a whole variety of ways. This is a company that's recognized, oh, wow, there's an uh, excess capacity of nutritionists out there, um, and they have very specific specialties. Why not match a person that needs to be on a specific diet with the right dietitian and come up with a plan that makes sense, with, which understands the particular chronic disease and understands that particular, um, you know, underlying uh, cultural context. So now we've now launched this. As it's, a, it's actually something anybody here could use. It's actually part of an HR benefit at the hospital at, at Boston Children's right now, and we're expanding that. So again, this is idea of using virtual care, um, but now taking excess capacity from people ar ar around the country. Um, 
The other opportunities in terms of improving the experience on, on the part of our providers is the optimization of care pathways and, and decision support tools. Um, again, not clear how many people have faced this issue, but at Boston Children's, we have protocols um, and decision support tools that are printed out in binders that people have to go look through. They're in Microsoft Access databases. It's completely uh, a disaster. But so we thought to ourselves, why not just sort of put this all into one bucket, a, a, you know, mobile optimized decision support tool that goes through all the care plans that exist across all our various specialties, put this all in a bucket, and people can just quickly refer to them in the care of patients. Can that sort of improve the use? them, improve the documentation, look for sort of deviations from potential plans and capture those as well. So that's one example where super simple, just pure digitization of content has had, had real impact. But then if you start thinking about beyond that, like why not think about taking uh, some of those decision uh, support tools and bringing those uh, to patients directly. So one way to reduce the sort of administrative burden that we face is to sort of put more into the hands of our patients themselves. And so we launched a tool called KidsMD, which usually takes sort of uh, decision support tools that we hand out and discharge to patients, digitize those and created sort of a dynamic tool that does things like look at sort of protocols around like fever and asthma um, and, and puts those all in one place. And we've actually now partnered with Harvard Pilgrim that uses those directly off of the Harvard Pilgrim website. So that's another example. Well, how do we go a little bit further than that? Well, I'm sure a number of you have interacted with chatbots in their daily lives. So what I talked to you about with KidsMD is very prescriptive. You, you know, it's a question and answer, but we are, it's very deterministic. Why not create sort of a, an opportunity to have a more diverse set of conversations with a tool before you even have a conversation with a provider? Um, we helped launch a company called Bowie, which is basically a symptom checker, but essentially the idea is takes all medical know-how around acute conditions, puts it into an engine that en uh, enables a sort of a conversational interface. It's not deterministic. Every question is de uh, that comes next is determined by your previous answer and allows you to come up with a sort of a triage on the part of the patient. Also gives you a diagnosis. Um, but very early on, some of these tools are incredibly valuable, right? So we have huge uh, problems with overuse of our emergency department, why not arm our patients with a tool that helps them sort of make a decision around triage? Should, should I go into the ED? Should I go to emergent care? Should I wait to see my primary care physician? Uh, should I treat at home? These are the kinds of decisions that these tools are making with already incredible accuracy. And so if you can think about sort of care as, um, and the technologies that can help routing, all of a sudden now we have huge opportunities to make sure we're giving pa bringing patients to the right, uh, to right spot, redu reduces unnecessary utilization of the ED and, and actually in fact improves our patient experience as well. And so now that is actually being rolled out as part of the sort of the front site of the Boston Children's website. If you look at the whole other component, so this is like patient generated data to help sort of make better decisions. Um, ultimately, there's a whole other component. Of course, the hospital is really known for taking care of rare and, uh, and complex uh, uh, children. Part of the issue is those uh, patients that are on diagnostic odysseys don't actually fully know uh, the right place to go to. They don't even know that their specialist for that particular condition exists at Children's because they don't even know what the condition is. So we've built essentially an engine, and this was more a coordination edge, uh, effort than actual technology, but this was this idea that, you know, patients are utilizing Google and social uh, patient social networks. How do you identify those patients and take them off of that diagnostic odyssey and match them the, with the right uh, provider? We launched, and this is still in sort of beta, a tool called Phenotyper, which basically takes um, terms, you know, lay terms that patients or you know, those parents would be providing about symptoms, creates those symptom sets and comes up with a list of possible diagnoses. And that's using sort of taking plain language symptoms and converting that to sort of computable phenotypes. Not incredibly uh, sophisticated, but the idea that you can start to bring matching um, from what people say they're experiencing to what the potential condition is, means that you can potentially reduce the time to a diagnosis and ultimately the time to a treatment. Um, so the idea for us is like, how do you identify those patients how do you get them quickly into a genome interpretation or reinterpretation and then funnel those patients much more quickly to a clinical trial or to uh, you know, a patient recruitment um, and to a diagnosis. So lots of different opportunities when you start to like, identify those patients and bring them uh, through this process. Lots of other examples where, you know, it's just basic digitization that can ultimately to lead to scale. So, for instance, one example is that we have an incredible research program around dyslexia and early literacy. 
data suggests that if you can identify patients early on around, uh, around issues and failure to read, you have much greater impact on the, on the opportunities of those long-term outcomes for that patient. Problem is, how do you identify if someone can't read, if they're before the age of reading? So the, the, there are screener tools that have been developed in-house, but they were just paper-based tools. We took those and digitized them and turned them into a gaming platform that essentially now means that we can provide that sort of insight about how to, uh, those early insights about failure to read to basically, you know, patients across the country and the world. There's a whole other issue with, you know, early identification of dyslexia and what that means for the capacity of schools to be able to handle that. So that's a whole other component of what we have to do. But it's, it's again, a basic idea of know how that exists within the hospital. How do you begin to scale that much more significantly? Similarly, on the, on the um, digital therapeutic front, I'm not talk too much about that, but one example is a company that we launched called Mightier. Uh, they have a gaming platform that uses sort of uh, feedback so on the part of the patient, so it detects stress levels or while the child plays a game, and the game modulates itself based on that detection of stress. And that actually has shown in clinical trials to be as effective, if not more effective, than traditional therapeutics. Again, this is the idea of like, how do you take that know-how and then build a, a true sort of gaming platform? So anyways, we had to turn this concept into a company. Now they've raised several rounds of funding, and they've, they've now deployed um, nationwide in terms of their ability to treat uh, kids with ADHD. Last component I'll mention in the sort of tech deployment front is again this idea that it's from an education standpoint, technology can play a huge amount, a, a huge role as well. Um, we, like many organizations, are trying to think about deployment of VR in ways that make sense. So we actually deployed a technology, um, a VR technology that gives people a sort of um, an immersive view of their disease based on actually uh, an EMR connection, which essentially allows a physician to um, create a colon that basically looks like the child's colon with exact ulcers and polyps and gives kids an immersive experience. From that immersive experience in clinical trials, we've seen now that kids are more likely to adhere to their prescription protocol because they understand what it means to have Crohn's or IBS. So again, this is an idea of taking sort of a concept of personalized education, building a wrapper of a VR tool around it, and then deploying it. So those are all sort of homegrown things. The reality for us is that um, it's really challenging to do things at scale without real partnerships. And of course, we can't read the news without seeing one of these logos in the news talking about their foray into healthcare. Um, and I'm sure many of those companies have come to you looking for data and opportunities. But the reality is that, and we know this, that a machine learning uh, sort of effort is sort of much more than the data itself. It's about identifying the question, the clinical expertise that's needed, the evaluation of, of the methodology Technologies. Um, and so the reality for us is if we're going to build partnerships with some of those great companies, we have to sort of be much more materially involved in the development of these tools. And so we have some really great examples of doing this. Uh, GE is an example where they're interested in our huge amount of um, sort of data sets around radi in radiology and pathology. Um, we built basically built a machine learning algorithm to essentially uh, detect normal from not normal in brains. Um, but again, they couldn't just have taken our data sets and built those algorithms. They needed the underlying context and expertise and annotation of those images in order to build something that makes sense. Similarly, another data intensive environment is the ICU, where we have huge amounts of real time time series data about patients. Again, it's this idea of being able to take uh, tag those large data sets with things like ventilator associated conditions, extubation, length of stay. And then now we've been able to build algorithms that essentially develop predictions on patients. Uh, which is generally quite challenging on the part of the physician to be able to see sort of huge amounts of data and make these kinds of decisions uh, in real time. Um, we're just about to launch a partnership with Verily. I'm sure you've heard of Google Life Sciences and you've heard different things about what they're doing. We rely heavily on FHIR and on our underlying data systems to build and, and augment our EHR. Uh, you know, our, our electronic health record only does, can do so much for us. Um, and uh, so we're having to build apps, and which is like many of you are doing this, so we built a FHIR-based application to do um, uh, essentially visualization of, of lab data and clinical uh, information to have a sort of a, a better view, a holistic view of a patient. But there are many other apps that are being developed right now in our systems to sort of optimize clinical workflow. The last uh, big sort of company that I'll just mention um, is Amazon. Um, we, uh, there was a big announcement that they had around HIPAA compliance and, and Amazon Alexa. How many people here have an Amazon Alexa? Okay, that's 
it's like less than the average US population. But yeah, it's, uh, so uh, it's what we're seeing in this, uh, maybe this is not, maybe this is a privacy centric group, which is good. Um, we've seen huge amounts of deployment of these technologies, smart listening devices that are in the home and uh, basically uh, powering things like obviously music or your lights or weather. We of course see it as a healthcare hub that if we can build information that exists from our uh, clinical systems, um, we can improve sort of a, a variety of, and I'll tell you about a few different examples. The reason we think that this is such a sort of hot area um, and why we're sort of betting pretty big on voice as a technology, um, whether it's Google, or Amazon, companies like Nuance, um, there are technologies that exist in the home that are built around discovery. There's a huge amount more data that comes from engagement with these tools. So there's more than just the words that you say. Obviously, they're more convenient. So it's a quick way to access information. Um, they're, they're obviously more intimate, so you might debate whether that's good or bad, but you get access to a lot more uh, from these tools. Um, and they're all based in the cloud. So of course, the opportunities are that this technology is incredibly cheap. So when you're thinking about purchasing technology, you know, the, the uh, sub $50 Alexa, or you know, sometimes way cheaper than that, or Google Home becomes like an automatic, and they're practically giving these things away, obviously, by getting closer into the household so that you'll want to make purchases or give away data. But uh, from our perspective, that deployment represents a real healthcare opportunity. Um, and so um, from our view of voice is already how we communicate in healthcare. So why not start to, start to use that? And so if you think about the evolution of technology that we've sort of undergone over the last 20 years, we we're trying to do patient portals about 20 years ago, mobile apps became all the rage, but they're really just sort of mobile optimized websites. So really what's the difference in sort of deploying them? These sort of smart and conversational interfaces become this real opportunity in deployment of healthcare. And so we reached out to Amazon a few years ago, we're like, well, why can't we start deploying Alexa in a variety of different ways, whether it's in the home to access your uh, patient portal, whether it's in the inpatient room to control features of the room or uh, in the outpatient setting which we think is the biggest opportunity is like, how do you take the conversation that happens between a patient and a physician and, and pull that uh, information together? Um, and so there's a whole range of different examples that are, that are evolving. And th you know, I'm just using this as a use case for how an innovation program would take a particular area um, and think, okay, there's a leading consumer technology. How do you bring it in? How do you start deploying? Uh, we built within the ICU a tech technology that allows us to quickly ask questions, dosing instructions, decision support, um, staffing a bed. So putting all the sort of things that you would want, like documents are scattered around the floor, putting them all into one bucket through, through, one, um, through one Alexa device. The same in transplant. Think about but the opportunities for checklists that are required in clinical practice. Now, all of a sudden, those are all voice activated. There's a screen associated to it as well, but it represents a huge opportunity in trying to reduce the amount of administrative burden that our clinicians are facing on a daily basis. Not to mention the fact that we're now deploying this in the patient room so patients can control things like features like lights and, and sound all, all, and also um, do things like make requests. So imagine a patient who just you know, instead of pressing the nurse call button, can say what they want. That voice turns to text, that triages the request, maybe it's food, maybe it's pain medication. Um, but again, that sort of reduces the amount of burden that our staff feels, but of course, improves uh, patient um, access. And of course, there's lots of opportunities on the patient remote monitoring side. Um, we've launched a bunch of skills like Flu Doctor, which reminds people about why to get a flu shot and our Kids MD platform, which sort of answers basic questions about kids to then, um, the opportunities around linking that directly with our patient portal. We've actually launched a whole platform. This was part of the Amazon announcement, which is all about sort of uh, providing a way for our patients to, to give feedback, like how their pain score post cardiac surgery or their activity levels, whatever it is, um, they can now push that directly through Alexa and their providers can be alerted to anything, any, any issues that those patients are experiencing in, in real time. Um, so anyway, so lots, lots of enthusiasm. Probably the concerns around some of these technologies are voiced by just the number of hands that I saw up, uh, given the concerns around privacy and reliability of content, and probably the, just the general frustration of still using these technologies. So we still have a ways to go. Um, and I'll just, so I know I'm running out of time, so I'll just try to close up here. Uh, the real opportunities become when you can start to pull the information beyond just what people are saying to these devices. So think about the sort of the components of mind and body that come through the interactions with these technologies, um, whether it's your uh, rate or rhythm or pitch 
again, this is like new vote biomarkers. And it's not just in voice or many other disciplines where we're seeing this sort of transformation of, of pulling sort of patient generated data uh, to the point where we can make um, assessments, whether it's, you know, cardiovascular disease, infectious disease, um, uh, lots of different outcomes can be sort of gleaned from this kind of level and granularity of data. So anyways, Part of the issue that we're facing as an innovation program is if we don't do this, then we're going to get completely disintermediated. Um, you know, think about the Alexa device, listens to you, identifies some issue, then throws you into a telemedicine visit with a pediatric specialist who then prescribes a prescription that arrives at your door um, through an Amazon filled order. All of a sudden now, it's unclear where a pediatric hospital exists within that equation. So from our perspective, that's sort of why we're trying to push the envelope because, it, you know, obviously we recognize the importance of what we have, but if we don't evolve, then uh, we're not going to exist tomorrow. So I'll leave it there. I don't know if there are any questions. Thanks so much. Questions? Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, I mean, there are two different varying answers to that. Um, you know, one could say privacy is dead, and you can you can make that claim. And then so basically, all the things you're generating on a daily basis. Now, this is just one level deeper because it's voice, but everything you're doing on your phone and you know you're you're logged into Google at all times. So there's a huge amount of data about you that exists somewhere, right? So that's a concern in itself. How big a concern is it? Um, I think people have different opinions about that. Um, and then there's the sort of the, the, the opportunities that we're seeing around trying to get people to, to opt into these tools, right? So from my view, you know, would I love an Alexa listening to me at all times and like tracking sort of changes in my voice and alerting me that I might have the flu before I have it? I actually would like that. Um, not probably not everybody in the room would want that. Um, but the question is, how do we begin to create a framework that opts people in, opts people into those research data sets? And of course, this is a group that can fi figure out these uh, things well better than I can. But you can get people to opt in to create those algorithms, and then people opt in to, to identify for those signals to be identified. It was really challenging for for Amazon to become HIPAA compliant, as you can imagine. Um, Alexa touches a lot of different components of the Amazon sort of ecosystem, but they got it done and they, you know, our, our legal is as challenging as, as any place. And I think they've been able to sort of justify um, that it works in the particular sort of use cases that we're deploying. But I think what you're talking about is a bigger issue, even regardless of using it for healthcare, the knowledge it has about you uh, and your health is, uh, is probably staggering. It really is. Yeah. I agree with you. I think, you know, these, Larger companies are grappling with this, of course, with the new rules that are happening across the EU and trying to figure out what it means to, to now opt into these things as opposed to opting out. I think we're going to see more and more of that. I think it's exciting because as much as it's great to get this mass amounts of data, it's much more valuable if we have patients that are opting in because it creates a communication channel and engagement. It puts people more at the center of their care rather than sort of being data feeds. So I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think this is an exciting area to solve. Do they have the answers? No. I mean, maybe but this group could probably figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. So these are not. Um, so what we started with was the fact that uh, Alexa was not HIPAA compliant. We had to create um, use cases that d didn't require that. So one is like protocols, right? Like how do you you get like a dosing instruction for a particular product? Like how to know how to dose them correctly, or like who's in staffing a particular unit in the hospital. Like these are all things that are not sort of HIPAA related because they're not patient data, but they're sort of administrative. Uh, or like, how do I page for a consult? Well, I can just do that through Alexa without like rummaging to find the page or number uh, for that person. So we try to take all the, all the use cases of sort of administrative burden and put those into uh, an, um, sort of an Alexa use case. Um, and, and that's sort of what we've done also with checklists and other things. So it's not capturing anything about patients. It's just basically referring people to protocols. Um, and that's the first use case. Now, the, there's exciting stuff that's coming. So uh, you may, and I didn't have t time to touch on this, but the real exciting opportunities are around the uh, capturing the conversation between the provider and the patient. And um, being able to sort of take that conversation and, and turn that into text and populate the, the EHR. Uh, well, there's some good prototypes that have now you know, exist, some startup companies, large companies like Nuance are building these tools. 
Um, and that's going to be really, I think, unlocking a huge amount of opportunity, you know, in terms of reducing the burden that physicians face and improving the experience that a patient has in terms of their a, a natural conversation that happens during a visit. Um, that's where I think that, you know, the real opportunity is, is going to come from. Um, it's, it, it's, it's variable, right? Like there's a lot, um, I've, I've seen mixed. I don't have like a good answer, right? Um, it really depends on the nature of the conversation. Um, you know, so yeah, I don't, I, it's, it's still early. I would say it's still early stages. Like there's still a huge amount more training data that is needed to, to turn these into sort of prime time, still doing a lot of, um, there's a lot of data that needs to, to sort of be generated for this to, to, to happen proactively. Yeah, those are those things that we're still building. We need, um, we still have to create some of those those integrations. I mean, partly like any other institution, we need to do a better job to, to escalate our mapping of, of, of fire elements. And so as opposed to just putting everything into the notes. Um, so we're starting that. We, there's a minimal amount of feedback, uh, but it's a little, it's, for the most part, it's sort of real time, sort of how do I, you know, get the inf information that I need today. Absolutely, the, the integration feedback loop is critical for sort of the long term view. Right. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll make those sort of, you know, we'll, we'll try to like open source as much as we can to, to sort of for people to replicate that. We're not sort of commercializing that product. Um, some companies might try to sort of take some of those learnings and try to implement them in other places, but it's generalizable enough that it doesn't have to be very specific to our instance because we're using the sort of fire mappings. It, it should be, we're, we're building everything for, for scalability. Like we're, we don't want to just build N of one solutions within our organization. I mean, that's we're, those days are, those days are over for us. We hope, well, we, yeah, right. <laughs> we hope. One last question. Yeah. I think it's, you know, this is, I can tell that this is a group that's very uh, sort of regulation and privacy minded, which is great. It's like never had this many questions in this one. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it's something that's not figured out. I think the lines are super blurry right now. I mean, we're trying to augment the physician with decision support, but how much are we just purely influencing their decision completely? I mean, ultimately, that's going to, that's, a, that's a real problem, right? Because we always say like, oh, AI is not about replacing the provider, but in some ways, even if you don't mean to be doing it, you're sort of doing a good chunk of their job and, and, and pushing them in a particular direction. I think that we, there's still no sort of good regulatory effort to think about. I mean, that has to evolve. What would you this change? Uh, I don't know. I think there's still a huge amount of pushback. I think there's an, enough of a question that still exists today. Does that totally flip down the road? I, I would predict probably yes, but at this point, we're still there's still a lot of skepticism that exists. Yeah. Yeah, thank okay, you. Great. Thanks so much, everyone.